Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Aisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! It's the Talk House Podcast. Keenan Kush with you, Talk House's Director of Operations. We have a fun episode for you. We are diving into our audio archives to bring you Kevin Parker from Tame Impala in conversation with Dan Snaith of Caribou. Since we have last aired this episode, we've seen re-releases from each artist. For Tame Impala, it was a box set of Inner Speaker. That's Kevin Parker's debut record for its 10th anniversary. We also saw a short behind-the-scenes film from the recording sessions behind Inner Speaker, and there's going to be a live stream event happening later this month where Kevin Parker and company will be performing Inner Speaker in full live from the Wave House. That is upcoming April 21st. More details in the description. For Caribou, Dan just released Suddenly Remixes, where we see some tracks get reworked by Fortet, Toroi Ma, Floating Points, and more. Like many Talk House conversations, both of them are huge fans of each other's work. They dive into how and when they first met, having confidence as an artist, and much, much more. Let's roll the tape. How you doing, Kevin? I'm good, man. I'm really good. I'm down south at the moment. I just started a rockin' fire. I'm, I'm getting better at making fires. There's a little fireplace here. Oh yeah, I've got to. I've got to remember. It's your evening. Wait, you're the place yeah. you're in is very dark by the looks of things. Are you there to record? Are you just there to uh, hang out? Or? Just, just here to hang out. Um, yeah, I'm just here for a few days on my own. I kind of like to just space out sometimes and uh, just go away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're in the UK, right? Yeah, I'm in the this room that I'm sitting in is my little basement studio. Awesome. And um, where I record everything. Yeah. Is that a is that a mini moog behind you? Yeah, you can see that. There's a mini moog. Is that an original or a reissue? No, it's a reissue. It's I mean, yeah, it sounds great to me. Yeah. yeah. The thing that I just bought a couple of days ago is a they're making an ARP 2600, but I bought an original one. I'd been playing Sam Floating Points one. I I used it on the my last record a bunch and I was just like this thing is out of this world wow. good like it's it's such a beautiful thing so that's that's yeah. the big that's the big one right yeah 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 you need like a, a, a university degree to be able to operate it i don't know about that I don't, really uh, yeah yeah you can use it without it being modular in any way oh and i there's see a, there's it is the one that there's a great video i think of ozzy osbourne trying to use it and he's just like <laughs> what really? the fuck is this <laughs> like he's so pissed off at right uh, it's pretty user friendly, actually. It feels like an instrument, you know, rather than something that's you have to like assemble yeah. like a lab. Yeah, it's playable like that. So, do you believe that there could be a digital version of that that would trick you into thinking it's the real one? Well, you know, I had this for ages because a lot of my well, my friends run the whole gamut of like buying every vintage synth imaginable mm-hmm. to being like, forget it. I'm just. You know, Kieran Fortet, for example, just makes music with nothing, basically. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's some samples and a laptop, and that's it. Some of my albums, like uh, Swim, the albums, like the music I was making 10 years ago, I did yep. use a kind of software version of an ARP 2600, uh, okay. and I was really happy with the way that it sounded. But then last y- year when I was working on Suddenly, the most recent album, yeah, Sam was like, I'll give you the keys to my studio. You can just come and mess around with whatever you want. And when I got in there and I played some of his stuff, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, that's why yeah. you just turn it on and it sounds unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. How about you? Are you, do you have like the perfect compressor that, you know, the perfect channel strip for everything? Or are you? Uh, it's so funny. Like I've, I've moved between being kind of sacred about objects or real things like, mm-hmm. like this real fucking DBX. 165, that's the juice, you know, like, like, that's it. And going like, what does it fucking matter? You know, like, Mm -hmm. whether you've got a real one, whether you've got a digital one, it's somewhere in the mix. Yeah. If you had two mixes of a song and you sort of switched out some piece of equipment in there for a different version of it, like, would anyone know or care? Like, you know, the, the world would keep on spinning. Totally, yeah. My philosophy is like, it's just how much fun you have making it. 
Like uh-huh. if you enjoy patching in that compressor from 1979 and you watch those the, the needles go back, you know, you watch the VU and you see it light up and you're like, oh, yeah, if that's what gets you through to the end, to the finish line of making it, if that's what is fun about the process, then that's all that matters, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also if you're using a piece of software... For me, anyway, I, I'm not using it to like exactly try and replicate something. You know, it's that would be no fun, like trying to force totally. it into into being this thing that it's not. But it's just about kind of approaching the things that you've got in a way that's fun and creative, and not spend it, like I don't don't want to get sucked into those like YouTube videos that are comparing this and that, and being like, I know. yeah, I think the you know the square wave on this is a I'm just like yep. forget it. And and I bet we also had a similar path in that. I started out making, like I, I made the, my first three albums without knowing that there was a thing called a compressor. Technical things, I had no idea. So I was just like yeah. making stuff in whatever way I could and trying to get it to yeah. sound like, decent. Is it your first three albums, is Andorra one of those? Wait, what number? No, that was the, that's the fourth one, yeah. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> But I still barely knew what a compressor was. And yeah. Because we were doing stuff by ourselves, I kind of assume in a fairly similar DIY way without being in a big expensive studio. Yep. We just figured out ways of doing things that didn't require those like classic pieces of equipment anyway. You know? Yeah, totally. It's funny. My, my favorite story with all that is like the first compressor I ever bought. I literally just went on eBay and typed in vintage compressor because I heard <laughs> that's what you, that's what you know. Hey, if you yeah. want a like, drum sound, you get a vintage compressor. So yeah. we went on eBay, searched for vintage compressor. The only one that was available in Australia was DBX165, and that's my favourite compressor now. It's just because it was, that was the one that was closest, the easiest to get. Right. And, and, now, and now I swear, but now it's like my favourite compressor. So I'm like, what if it was different compressor? You know, yeah. I feel like it's like football teams, you know, like... <laughs> Like, why do you go for that team? It's just because you started going for it one day and now, now you die by them, you know what I mean? Totally, yeah, totally. It's funny, do you feel like, a, because I think you have such a wonderful sound and characteristic sound in your production that people would say like, oh, Kevin Parker, he's like a master of studio technique. And this could, same question, if we want to move away from techie kind of stuff, could apply yeah. to like songwriting or yeah. whatever playing your, the instruments that you play, you're obviously super proficient as well. But my impression, I don't know what people think when they feel my records, listen to my records, but I always, my feeling is like, I just barely know enough about what I'm doing to like get this record done. And I, when I start a new one, I'm like, why didn't I learn anything? Like the last totally. six or seven albums I made, I'm just like sitting there. It's not that I, there's, I, I, I can get started, but I'm like, how the fuck did I do that last time? Like, what, what, why don't I know how to do this yet? I don't yeah. know. How do you feel on that spectrum of? Well, the first thing I'll say about that is like, I think that's a good sign because it's like, I think it's a sign that you don't rely on sort of techniques that you've sort of repeatedly learned. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like that you're not going about it the same method each time because if you did that you'd get better and you and you'd be and you'd know that you were proficient yeah that like the fact that we kind of just feel it out mm-hmm. each time is a sign that we do it organically you know mm-hmm. that's that's the way I see it because like I I 100 feel exactly the same way I feel like every time I write an album I have to like relearn how to write a song yeah you know I'm like how do, how do you write a song like, wh- totally. like how do you mix a drum kit <laughs> you know? yeah and I and with that kind of thing I kind of feel like I'm the worst in the world at it until I'm suddenly the best in the world and it's it's such <laughs> an immature way of looking at it everything from writing lyrics to drum sounds mm-hmm. I'm like this is trash this is awful this is embarrassingly shit and then suddenly like oh it's brilliant mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like suddenly it's like, oh, you know, this is like, I I could stand by this. I could share this with the world and feel good about it. I think like a huge part of why it's still as exciting and fun and everything for me as right at the beginning was that that like moment is still there when things just like click and I'm like, fuck, yes, this is this is really working. Yeah. I feel like that's what we do it for. Yeah, totally. You know, it's like that moment of going like, oh, it's yeah, Yeah. chasing the dragon. 
<laughs> but even when that happens, sometimes I'm like, did I do that? Or did it just like did it happen by coincidence? I have moments when I'm like, you know, d- did that just kind of fortuitously fall into place? And I guess that's a kind of confidence thing. Now, looking back over the years, I'm like, I've made stuff that I'm happy with enough times mm. that there's something in there that even if I'm not consciously aware of how to put those pieces together, yeah. I'm doing something right. And, I, and, and that helps me just like trust the process of just make music, yeah. make music. And that moment will happen again, you know? Yeah. Oh, so many questions that I have. I'm just, they're all bottlenecking into one. (laughs) In the whole question of confidence as an artist, do you think that you are slowly becoming more confident? Like each time you release something that you can sort of confidently say it's good. I only ask that because I feel like I am slowly growing in confidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it all all comes crashing down sometimes. You just want to delete everything you've ever done. But Mm -hmm. I feel like when I first released an album had no confidence in it you know I wasn't able to say that I enjoy it and and I think like having no confidence in it and then sort of like retrospectively looking back and going like oh it was pretty good you know like mm-hmm. realizing that that's a cycle yeah and that like each time you do it that's probably what's going to happen again like when I release an album usually it's that's like the lowest point of my opinion of that that's funny that's different it, and, and it sort of goes up from there okay <laughs> you know yeah like it's funny because you I remember you, you emailed me a little while ago saying like hey let's like swap albums mm-hmm. and that was just when I'd finished the slow rush I'd just finished recording of it mm-hmm. recording it uh, and that's usually when I, I can't listen to like any music that I hear that's amazing just sounds incredible it, it always sounds depressingly good you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. and you were like hey I like seeing my album, and I remember saying, "Like, please don't." Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I, "I can't, I can't, I can't deal with a, car- a new Caribou album." And I was, now. I was like, know, that's... <laughs> "Yeah, I could, I could recognize that." But it's funny; it, it happens at a different time for me because, and this is f- super fascinating to me. Again, I'm, the questions are bottlenecking again. I, I do feel like yeah. generally I'm kind of growing in confidence. And the other thing that's super important to me is having the same two people my whole the 20 years I've been making music, my wife and Kieran Hepton, Fortet, both of those people will take me down. I trust both of their tastes in music and they will tell me with like the unvarnished truth. They'll just be like, yeah, this is garbage. Move on. Like, you know, and that's wow. so, so important. But the other thing that's important for me and, you know, we're both working by ourselves, right? That's peculiar or a little bit peculiar about us, I suppose, or di- uh, we have in common yeah definitely the thing is that and this blows my mind about you is that i need to let it sit like by the time i'm sending you that album that that i've quote unquote just finished sure maybe i've just finished the like final tweaks and the mixing and mastering and stuff but the songs and all the parts of it have been done for months i'm sitting on it i'm sitting on it and that's how i get a sense of that i'm happy with it whereas i've heard in interviews you talk about like you know, I'm finishing it, the song tonight and then it's going off to mastering tomorrow. And, and you know, like you're finishing significant parts of a song at that late stage. That would scare the shit out of me because, you know, what if, mm. you, we've all had that moment where you listen back to something a week later and you're like, oh, no, that, I was excited yeah. about that. But it's not what I thought it was yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So having that deadline between like putting parts of the song together and it being like stamped, signed and sealed finished would really scare me because i think past the passage of time is something that i rely on so yeah yeah how do you do that how do you do it's it's traumatic yeah it's traumatic and every time i do it i swear to myself that i'm not going to let myself do it again because it's all because like i'm a procrastinator right and it will be my own fault because i will say like oh like i want to release the song like at this point in time like a month from now, and so like the record label will have set the date, and they'll be like, "So you know, are you gonna have it done by then?" I'm like, "Yep, definitely." Right. <laughs> you know, like, and so I, I end up just backing myself into a corner every time where I have to come up against. It. But I mean, usually it's kind of just with like a song or or a um, when it comes to the album, and I haven't finished it, I haven't finished it. Like when it comes to what really matters, I never really do it like that you know right but yeah but some of the pressure helps you think because i i just don't let that, those deadlines be set you know i won't let a release date or whatever be set or a mastering date even be set until i'm confident that yeah okay the only things that need to be done on this are kind of cosmetic little 
fixes or whatever that I know I can do. I'd never do it. Yeah. A hole in the record with where a song should be kind of, or something like that. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's really admirable. And, and, uh, I think I'm just scared. I don't know if it's admirable. I, I, yeah. Well, I, I, I self-disciplined then. Right. You know, maybe, yeah. I, I guess like sometimes I get a bit wrapped up in the excitement of releasing a song or the whole world of releasing music. For example, um, like before a festival or something. Mm -hmm. I, I get a bit lost in that that world, you know. But it's it provides yeah. excitement and, you know, like pressure can be good, I think, sometimes. I don't know. Maybe. I'd... Yeah, I think it's essential. Yeah. I'd probably never finish anything if I didn't. Right. right it's right, funny right. because, like, by the time I'm finished a song, for me, like, the best moment of making music is kind of like that kind of, that aha moment that we sort of touched on before. Mm -hmm. That moment of like, oh, I've got it, you know, which happens for me kind of like a long time before I finished the song. Yeah. Um, and so finishing the song is really just to share it with the world, you know. Finishing it is because it's that, it's that kind of like process. Yeah. I probably wouldn't finish music if I didn't have to release it. Yeah, right. All my songs would just be perpetually in the state of unfinished. Yeah. Because like, yeah, making those kind of decisions can be tough, you know. Do you rely on other people's feedback at all? Because if you're in a band with people, there are other people in the room, whether you like it or not, telling you what, that they like that yeah. bass part or whatever. Uh, we're not, there's nobody else in the room most of the time. So do you rely on people's opinions or do you just laser focus, trust your own judgment on things? I try to trust my own judgment, but I mean, I hate what my brain does when I play it to people. You know, I'm oh, so... Yeah sensitive to their every yep. facial movement. Do you, does, does the same thing happen to you? Like, it just because, sounds different, because like, doesn't it? It's, just, it's weird. It's like, it sounds <laughs> oh, like a no. different song. Yeah. It's, yeah. But the, Isn't that funny? Which, which is, I think is really helpful, right? I mean, it kind of, to get outside of our, be, being so inside the, the bubble of our own perspective. Yeah. But it is terrifying, yeah. Yeah, and I also think like, if you're anxious of playing it to that person, like in, in the way that you hear it differently, that can be sort of a bad distortion of reality. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you'll think the vocals are louder th than they are mm -hmm. or you'll be like, oh, you know, like, you'll think that like the vocal is too dry or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you become more self-conscious. It's a fickle, it's a strange beast. Yeah. <laughs> playing, playing music to people, definitely. Do you, do you like the songs when you've played them live a hundred times? I mean, or are there some of them you like less every as the time goes on or how does that work or is it a totally um, different thing you know does it not even relate to it's kind of separate i mean <laughs> it uh it usually sounds better because when when i'm singing live you know it's kind of like it's a it's a raucous environment you know i've had a few drinks you know what i mean like it's it's kind of like the, the live thing is rough you're pitch perfect when you sing i i mean as of another question <sighs> that i wanted to ask you for me singing is the thing that I should not be doing. You know, I, I'm not a singer and I am embarrassingly bad at singing. I went as long as I could with playing live shows where we had the vocals on a backing track and kind of a video mm -hmm. in a kind of Flaming Lips style. Do you remember they did that kind of thing? Yeah. Anything to get me out of actually having to sing live. And then at some point right. it was obvious, okay, now I'm going to have to start. And we did a whole tour when I just sung one song live. And then I gradually got to the point where I'm singing all the songs live, obviously. Yeah. But sometimes I think, okay, this is like a really severe limitation on what I can do musically. You know, put me in front of a piano and I'm totally happy and comfortable because that's my home instrument. But singing is something I have to work at. And sometimes I think mm -hmm. maybe that's good, you know. Maybe it means that the melody has to really work or click because just listening to my voice singing isn't enough. You know, there's got to be something engaging about the melody or the how it fits with the harmony or something like that. But I think that's one of the interesting things about Caribou is that like your vocal melodies and the way you sing them, the melodies are so melodic and they're so, so you know, pretty. And some of those kind of almost pop R&B melodies, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the kind of melody where you could imagine someone else singing it, someone with like, you know, some crazy R&B voice. But it's interesting that it's your voice singing it. You right. Know? Like that's, that's, that's what gives it that kind of like interesting edge. Yeah, I've kind of got to a point where I understand that over the, you know, being able to be like, okay, that is what's different. About, thank you yeah. for saying that. Can I ask you a, 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 a little side bonus question? Yeah. When you imagine vocal melodies, do you imagine 
someone else singing it? Like, does it sound like it's your voice? Or do you imagine it sounding completely different? And then like when you sing it, it's your voice, you know? A weird question, but yeah. There have been times when I've thought about other people singing it or thought, you know, this would be a good melody. Am I going to be able to pull it off? But definitely the more Mm -hmm. I've gone through it and the more I've got to know my voice and the limitations of it, the more I'm like, it isn't just about writing a melody. It's about writing a melody that I can make work and will work with my voice. So now it's, it is very much more about, I kind of know what this melody is going to sound like when I sing it. And is that going to work or not? And if not, I've got to find another melody Mm -hmm. that is, it's about fitting a melody with the limitations of my voice or the kind of particulars of my voice. Well, it's working. It's working either way. (laughs) But so, and I was going to say like in your music, all the elements, there's kind of no chink in the armor, you know, every, you seem really proficient at all of the, you know, songwriting, producing, playing all the instruments. It's remarkable. It's amazing. But do you feel that there are limitations that you're pushing up against in your own abilities that help you or hinder you or whatever? Well, it's funny because I kind of feel the opposite about my individual elements. You know, like I feel like none of them are amazing on their own, but all put together, they make something unique. It's like it's like a house of cards. <laughs> you know? Like I feel like just me singing on someone's song wouldn't be very special or just me playing guitar in a band wouldn't be very good. But for some reason, it all kind of comes together. and Maybe it's got something to do with the fact that it's the same person doing it. Yeah. I believe in the sort of like the strength of a singular vision. Yeah. You know, in the way that bands that work well, they're all kind of in the same headspace, you know, they're kind of like connected. Mm-hmm. And when you hear someone's music, where they've applied that vision to every part of it, then it has this kind of like cohesiveness that there's nothing else like it, like Stevie Wonder, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I, that's a, a really good description of your music. I think it has totally that has that character. But then if I think about the individual elements, like I hear a little bass riff or something, I'm like, that is so Kevin. <laughs> wow. Thanks, man. But I think you're right. The, the fact that each part of the song has your characteristic in it makes it a really coherent thing. And that maybe that's the same of, for people who work solo. Mm-hmm. That's something. So then a difference between us is that you've done a bunch of collaboration in the last few years. And I <laughs> never do any collaboration. I basically right. only ever work by myself. And and you have yeah. just sung on people's songs or helped them write a song or played an instrument on their song. Yeah. How's that work? You know, when someone asks me to sing on their song, I feel like saying like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I do. I, I say, okay. But I'm not like, oh, yeah, yeah. You don't want to really work on this song? My right. words. You know, like I never, I never think that. <laughs> when I do a vocal feature, I usually just sort of consult with myself that like they want the Tame Impala vocal sound mm-hmm. rather than they want me person. They want kind of like, they don't want it to sound great. They just want it to sound like Tame Impala. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's kind of, it's, it's what I kind of subconsciously think. But uh, yeah, I mean, the whole thing with collaborating for me is that it's sort of like I'm trying to find things that I can do that aren't what I usually do. Right. You know, like someone from a completely different genre that I can sort of like learn and try something new. Mm-hmm. You know, like the more different it is from what I usually do, the better usually. It's kind of like a fantasy land, you know, <laughs> where I'm not this one artist that has a sound and has a process. It's right. like, what if all the variables have changed? But then obviously it's at the end of the day, it's always, it's the real world. So, um, yeah. But does it, and does it make it more fun and less pressurized and easier to do in some way? You know, like, do you end up agonizing over it like you would a Tame Impala record? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's something that you're contributing to and, and, and I care about it. I want it to be good. You know, like yeah. the fantasy is that it's like, there's like no pressure. Mm-hmm. It can be anything. It doesn't matter if it's shit, you know. But of course, it, it does matter. It, do, it, it, it matters just as much as any other piece of music yeah. um, that you do. Do you get asked to collaborate, to like produce things? Yeah, I mean, remixing is the, one of the most common things I get asked to do, I guess. Okay. And, uh, and production and stuff like that, you know, movie soundtracks, those kind of things. Yeah. And, and at some point I just thought, looking back at the music that I made, the remixes were the things that I was least happy with. And, mm-hmm. and also the things that I least wanted to do 
partly because of that deadline problem. You know, there's like a deadline and you have to hand something in. Wow. And if I'm only 70% wow, yeah. happy with it, I still have to hand it in. And and that was kind of the time that I had kids as well, or our first yeah. daughter. And I just said, you know what? I think I'd just be happier if I just had a blanket like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm so slow working. I mean, I'm sure everybody feels that way, but I'm, I feel like I'm really slow working on my own stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's probably what makes me happiest and I kind of looking back at or most proud of. So I'm yeah. just going to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really, that's really strong. That's really um, disciplined. Because like, for me, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> I could say the same thing to myself and then someone would come a week later and say, hey, do you want to do this? And I'll be like, ooh, okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but yes, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm just being stupidly adherent to a rule that, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, it goes both ways. Are you ever tempted to just sort of like give people songs, like write a song for someone and, and get them to sing your, you know, in, in the way that you don't think that your vocal sound is the best ever? Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing, I, I think this is different between you and I too, is that the thing that, that I end up with after having made an album is I've made, every day I make like two or three little sketches which don't have vocal melodies. They're just like a loop, you know, I've keyboard part, yep. drums, something else. And I end up with like hundreds and hundreds of those. That's my process is just making wow. loads and loads of those. There's no pressure making one of those because if it's yep. crap, it just goes in the garbage pile. But then I end up with a bunch of them that are like, there's something good about that, but it's never going to, I'm not going to finish it because it's not as good as the other things or it doesn't fit with the other things. And sometimes yep. I'm tempted to, in another world or another context, like I could give those to a collaborator or somebody who wants to sing over something. And mm. I, I mean, it seems like super wasteful to have made all this music and then literally just put it all in the trash, which yep. is generally what happens. But am I right in thinking you write the number of songs that are on the album, basically, or close to it? You know, like, yep. that's yep. amazing. Well, it's 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 more just sort of like, I start ideas, but like, I'll never come close to finishing a song that isn't definitely going to be released. Right. Does that mean you're one of those people that you'll make tons of stuff and then select the best stuff that you want to release? Exactly that, yeah. I let them sit for a while, so the ones I'm not super happy about don't get very far mm-hmm. along. It's not like I've got hundreds and hundreds of almost finished songs. They're like draft kind yep. of ideas. Oh, sure. But but I've heard you talk about having a song kind of appear in your head almost fully formed. And if, mm-hmm. if anything, I'm the polar opposite of that. I have to actually get my hands on a instrument. Yeah. And, and yeah. then that's easy and productive. And I never like have kind of writer's block and those kind of things, especially because sometimes I get like, you know, a melody in my head or something. But then when I try and yeah. record it, it just turns into trash you know the, the yeah. version isn't that sad when that yeah happens? that is definitely you know yeah sometimes i feel like some melodies are just not meant to belong they're not meant to be a part of the real world in the real you world know? like yeah. like because you'll think i think it's like a melody over some chords mm-hmm. or a melody over a bass line or something and for some reason it works in your head but you listen to it in real life and it's like suddenly it has to I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's weird. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess that song just, is just it has to live in my head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? I think that's good. Again, it's like kind of the, this, this puzzle that we haven't figured out after doing this for a while. There's still a mystery to it. You yeah. know, it's not as simple as being like, I know that's going to be. I mean, so, I think some people probably have that ability to just be like, I know this is going to be something great. Yeah. I've just got to follow it through. But I like that it's, yeah. it's a little hard to track down. Stevie Wonder probably. Exactly. Uh, that was who I was thinking of as well. <laughs> Are you missing playing live shows? How do you feel about the fact that we both have kind of de facto lockdown albums, given that they came out like right before all of this? Yeah, isn't that funny? I, get, I guess you've probably been getting messages from people being like, you know, your album's been something that I've listened to lots in this time. And well, they'll always associate sure. it with that this time. Well, see, I'm a little bit scared of this album being an album that people forever associate with this time just because this time is kind of like it's its own time in the world and and everything is so crazy mm-hmm. and it's an emotional time for a lot of people mm-hmm. but at the same time it's kind of like it's also a terrible and kind of like it's this nothingness time mm-hmm. and I hope that it reminds people of something other than just getting stuck at home yeah <laughs> you know what I mean right. that's the only thing I'm, I'm, I'm worried about but the music that you make and probably the music that I make to some degree is such a kind of world inside your head you know what I mean that, so that is I true. feel like I mean making music for me is an escape into something unreal as well and so 
I imagine that our music has, has done that in this time for that's people. very true that's a good way of looking at yeah. it i don't know i mean i we don't have any choice in it you know that's that's the other thing it's just has that's happened. it yeah yeah and uh yeah i mean obviously i'm missing playing live it's funny i didn't i didn't really even register until just recently that we that we're not playing live i mean obviously i did but mm-hmm. it's like i try to be kind of glass half full about mm-hmm. it about it, like everything and uh given that people like you and i we can still do what we do mm-hmm. And especially because we're kind of self-sufficient yeah. recording, we can still do a large part of what we love to do as though nothing ever changed. And for that reason, we're extremely privileged. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And so I kind of feel I kind of feel bad about complaining that we can't do the other thing we love doing, which is playing sure. live. No, that you know? is totally fair. Yeah. But yeah, it suddenly just it hit me the other day. You know, I was like, oh yeah, we're not I'm not doing that thing that I love doing. You know, like I got so sort of like caught up in the pandemonium and the kind of mm-hmm. like craziness of coronavirus kicking in that I forgot that it, that we just started this tour that we worked really hard yeah. on. We played three shows. Really? Yeah, okay. yeah. We, we, we were just about to start this big kind of like North American leg. Yeah. And the plug got pulled after a uh, third show. How about you? Had you started touring? We were in a, um, we've never done this before, like got a full production kind of wa- warehouse. Our first date was, I don't know, March 13th or 14th or something like that. Wow. And, uh, and we were having these kind of, you know, I don't I don't have a manager. I don't have like a lot of like infrastructure around me. So it's literally me, the guys in the band, our lighting engineer and our sound engineer sitting there being like, well, what what do we do? You know, what happens? Wow. To, we're, we're getting on a flight tomorrow at 9 a.m. But things are just increasingly going crazy every day. Shows are still, you know, the yeah. UK was a bit ahead of some parts. Of, we were starting in Canada and there weren't that many cases in Canada. And looking back at it, I, was, yeah. I, I think... We were so in this weird denial, which I guess everybody yep. was to some totally. degree, totally. thinking that we were just going to, I mean, we, I, yeah, it gradually dawned on us. And it was literally 8 p.m. the night before we were f- supposed to f- catch a flight the next morning. I was like, okay, everybody, we're not going anywhere. This yeah. is, you know, yeah. And isn't it funny how how much it changed every day? Every day was like, you mm-hmm. know, it sort of grew in intensity or, yeah, no one knew what was going to happen 24 hours from now, you know, what state the world was going to be. Yeah, exactly. I think I, I, we can be forgiven for being so naive because totally. it was this thing that was changing so fast yeah. and, and you know, seemed unreal, all the things that have developed since mm-hmm. then. Yeah. But to change topic a little bit, I just thought people might want to hear about us meeting the first time. Okay. Do you remember when that was? Uh, was that in New Zealand? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so was that, because I knew that we met up then, I didn't know if we'd met sort of at a festival or something before Not then. before that, I don't think, yeah. We, the, there was that festival called Camp Aloham. That's it, Camp Aloham. Which was so cool. It was in the middle yeah. of nowhere in New Zealand in uh, mm-hmm. school or like a holiday camp or something. Or, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was really freeform compared to most music festivals. Like there wasn't even a kind of fence around it. or People just, if they'd come that far, that they were yeah. obviously supposed to be there. And uh, yeah, um, and we played in like the bottom of a swimming pool or something. Yeah, and I remember you—you you were just hanging out. I think I don't. Did you play there or when I met you, you were just hanging out? <laughs> I was just about to say I don't know if I was playing or not. I think I was—I was playing in part my my friends. Uh-huh. Band okay, but yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Right. I was playing drums for them, um, which I've now realised that I was playing at the time, but I could easily have just been there, just hanging out with them. We were with Kieran Fortet. Maybe he knew you or somebody knew you and you were just like hanging out on the grass. And then I remember you had a laptop and headphones and you were working on stuff for Lonerism, I guess. And you played me. That would have been that, yeah. Uh, Nothing that has happened. You just gave me, you were like, oh, check this wow. out. And I was like, holy shit. Like yeah, that, was, I was, that moment oh, has wow. always stuck with me. I must have been a, a lot more brash back then because I don't know how I gathered up the courage to play you <laughs> unrelated stuff well, stuff that I was working on. I think on. maybe you play, were playing it to other people and I was like, can I have, you know, can I have a list? Yeah, it, but anyway. Yeah. That festival was so, it was a kind of festival utopia. Yeah, there's a few, there's a few of those kind of things around Australia where it's kind of just yeah. like, if you know, you know, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Things that I guess, I guess because they're of that nature, they don't, they don't last mm-hmm. very long. Right. You know, like they either grow, they either grow too big to be, what they started out or people just say like, oh, we had a good couple of years doing it and then like just stopped doing it, you know? Yeah. Which is, which is kind of romantic, I guess. Yeah. Do you ever miss playing kind of scrappy, weird gigs? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, just by sort of the way it's naturally evolved. It's it's such a big operation now, the yep. the Tame and Parlor show. You know, we kind of just we just kind of grew into that role of like, okay, we're gonna you know, we we for one festival one time we just we got a creative design team, we got like, you know, mm-hmm. we did the whole thing like weeks of pre production stuff. And then for some reason and then just it just sort of turned into that being the way we do it now. You know, right. it's like, all right, I guess we're but uh, yeah, I was just thinking the other day, like, God, I miss playing those kind of small, sweaty shows, you know, mm-hmm. where, where where everything is so uncontrolled. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the bigger you get as a live act, the, the more everything is controlled. Like the temperature is controlled, the sound is controlled. You yeah. know, you're so far from the front of house speakers yeah. that you have your own little personal mix, and it's completely controllable. But uh, I miss just sort of not knowing what's going to happen, you know, not, not knowing what the place is going to look like, or how it's going to sound or, yeah. Yeah. How about yeah. you? We're obviously on playing shows on a smaller scale, but still it's like if if this place doesn't have the kind of lighting and video spec that we need, we can't do a show there, you know? And, and sometimes yeah. I think, you know, yeah, and exactly. that means that the show is always as we kind of want it to be. But I th- thinking back about our early days of doing shows, some of those places that we, you know, if we'd have known what we were getting into, we probably would have been like, this isn't a good idea. Mm-hmm. But then they ended up being so fun and weird and scrappy and mm-hmm. memorable and, you know, met people through those kind of experiences and stuff. That's one so. of the things that I was so inspired by when I, when, when I was seeing you guys live those times. Because it was kind of like over a, over a couple of years, I think we kind of like crossed paths in festivals a lot. And it always struck mm-hmm. me how sort of uh, inventive you were with the stage layout and how you did it and because everyone was kind of facing each other. I'm not sure if that's how you still do it. You know, it mm-hmm. seemed like you were just using the, the platform of, of the stage to kind of do it your own way, you know, like you didn't, yeah, difficult to describe, but um, I always thought that was great. I'm glad to hear you say that because, you know, we still set up our own gear before a yeah. festival performance. Yeah. And, that, and I'm like, I'm aware that kind of sends a message, you know, yeah, uh, that people are like this. These guys are doing in this kind of weird DIY way. Yeah. We're all huddled in the middle, and th- that came about in the funniest way. We, you know, we we were playing small stages, and we wanted to be close to. We had to be close to one another, mm. and then we'd show up at a festival, and there'd be a big stage, and we would be like, "Yeah, but there's a cable running from me to him, so I can't be any further away." Yeah. You know, so we'd and we'd end up on a big stage, being like is this a bit stupid? You know, we're like huddled yeah. right in the middle. Yeah. But then let's just embrace that. Totally. But then also, I, I do think sometimes the, that kind of attitude shuts me down from, you know, you've, yeah, I've seen you play in different environments and the show is so incredible and obviously requires so much work and is mm. such a big production, but is amazing. And, and, you know, if I'm just being like, We've got to like stick to this weird setup that we're all together. Does that close off possibilities of making it something really cool? Uh, do yeah. you, yeah, like n- now that you've got this huge kaleidoscopic spaceship landing stage show, uh, recently anyway, do you enjoy playing those shows because you're like, man, this, I mean, I've had those moments even with our show when I'm like, this is insane looking around, you know, like the yeah. amount of flashing lights and mm. things. It adds to my enjoyment of it. And I can only imagine makes people enjoy the show. More, yeah, so. yeah, I I do love it. I mean, I am kind of like resigned to the the fact that that's kind of how it is now. I do often get frustrated at how kind of rigid the process can become. You know, like mm-hmm. things happen a lot less spontaneously, like just in the production of it. You know, mm-hmm. for example, mm-hmm. it's really difficult to add a song. You know, just say you wanted to right. uh, in the middle of a tour. It's like, right. hey, we're going to play this song tonight. You know, the production manager will go like, whoa, hang on there, hang on there, Sonny. You know, like we haven't, we haven't striped time code uh, and sent yeah. it to these various departments that control yeah. everything. You know, like, like things are connected in ways of technology I don't even understand. Right. Yeah, in that way it can become a little bit, it's not as organic, you know. But it's kind of, it's kind of just something like I've kind of just realised I have to work with, you know, because that's the only way that it can be like as momentous as it is, sure. I guess. Yeah. But I am always kind of inspired to find ways to buck the system and kind of like, even though yeah. it's that big and even though we've got all this stuff, we can still do it our way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the most wonderful things outside of Tame Impala, the music itself, I don't know if you feel this, but I feel like 
the scale of its popularity and how culturally ubiquitous it's become is somehow like unlikely. And Mm -hmm. there are no other bands like you at that scale, like headlining festivals, selling out arenas and stadiums, (laughs) you know, because it doesn't fit into some like mode or whatever. Sure. And I mean, on some smaller level, I feel the same. Whenever we step out on a big stadium stage, I'm like, it's so cool that we're playing this Mm -hmm. weird music Mm -hmm. to this many people. Do you feel that? I mean, are you proud of that? I do. I mean, I can't explain it. Um, and it's funny because I get asked that a lot, you know, like, yeah, how do you explain it? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> not, not that it's a backhanded compliment, but it's always like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I honestly don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm getting close to understanding, <laughs> understanding why people like Tame Impala, but at the same time, I'm like, if I don't, if I don't understand why people like Tame Impala, maybe that's a good thing. You know, because that because that I'll explode it. <laughs> it does seem like a bit of a back. I, the the way I look at it is it's kind of like I look at some bands and some music and some operations. When you see the kind of management, everything's so like by the book, straight ahead. It's a business kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then I see other people. I'm like, you're a weirdo. Like I'm a weirdo. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it's just so nice to see those things thriving, yeah. and it makes me really. Uh, happy for and 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 you know you you meet um, people who are there are loads yeah. of people who are genuinely fans of music that's weird and interesting and does all sorts of things so it's not surprising in that sense but it's just like right on I'm so glad that 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 Thanks, is man. possible you yeah know? anyway if if we talk about nothing else I I want to talk to you about I want to <laughs> I'm not going to ask you anything I'm just going to talk at you um, <laughs> I want to tell you about how I first heard your music. <laughs> Even though you didn't ask, <laughs> no, I do. I do want to know about that. I'd it's funny to. because, like, leading up to this to this thing we're doing, I realized I haven't really thought about this moment since it happened. But I was at this kind of house party, and it was kind of like a small kind of kind of gathering, kind of just like you know, drinking, weed, smoking kind of house party. And I just I had one of those moments where you know when you like when you hear something. And you just like everyone, shut the fuck up. What is that? <laughs> you know, like you, you, you get you get a little bit kind of um, selfish, you know, because you're like, okay, everyone, shut up. <laughs> Someone tell me what that is. You know, usually I'm not like that. I'm I'm I'm, I'm not as rude, but I yeah. just remember someone had this little boombox and they were playing Melody Day, uh, and I just remember sitting next to it and I made them repeat it. Uh, and I was Amazing. asking my my friend Nick. It was I was like, who is this? I remember loving it because it reminded me of uh, a little bit of like Dung Yen, yeah. Who I who who I, who I love because it has that snare, that beat with it's like leading on the snare, you know, da, mm-hmm. da, 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 which is just kind of like a, a beat that I love. It, it, it always gets me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was it. That's <laughs> wicked. That, so I like you know when I got the album and everything. And I'm so happy to have been one of those moments for sure. And definitely, yeah. I was listening to Dung Yen loads when I was making that oh, album okay. for sure. Yeah. Have you seen them live? Yeah, I finally saw them live. Yeah. Um, a little while ago. It took me a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I just remember thinking like, oh, you know, I love Dung Yen, but I'll never hear something modern that that kind of has that kind of effect on me. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that's why I was so kind of like taken aback when I heard Melody Day and 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 all the songs I endure because it had that like that really beautiful kaleidoscopic melody and kind of like tonality. But you could tell it was electronic. That's what blew my right. mind. It was like, oh, because that's it's always kind of like been a sort of a musical goal for me mm-hmm. is like something that's so kind of like there's something organic and human sounding, but in this kind of electronic realm. And I feel like you've always nailed that elusive thing. You know, it's like it's electronic and repetitive and yeah, electronic, but it but it has this, but it's so overwhelmingly human. Well, thank you for saying that. You know, I mean, it's so real. Th- th- it, I think that just comes about through happenstance. Like I was trying to make a zombies album, you know, uh, right. but the, I instead of being in Abbey Road Studios, I had like a crappy laptop and a pile of records that I'd sample like two notes of a flute off of, and then try and put it in the right yep. place. And and uh, if anything, what, you know, I'm I'm really proud of that album, Andorra. And but if anything, when I look back at it, that's my only criticism. I, I was like trying so hard to make something that captured those kind of 60s, early 70s psychedelic records. But I love that about it, that I was trying to do that, but I failed. And that's kind of why (laughs) it was 
sort of maybe sort of interesting, you know what I mean? Like uh, I absolutely. aimed for something and I missed, and the thing the miss was actually more interesting than it, than if I'd actually been capable of doing the thing properly. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny that, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I feel like there, there are so many examples of that in history, musically at least, of people trying to sound like something. You know, Gary Newman, he was kind of like a punk rocker, right? Mm -hmm. And he was trying to make dance music or something. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know. The other one I heard was um, Outkast when he made Hey Ya. Mm -hmm. He was trying to make it sound like The Hives. I don't know if that's true. What? Oh, my God. Because like, cause that, cause that song is just like, <laughs> is such an anomaly. Yeah. There's no other song in the world like Hey Ya. Yeah. Yeah. There's never has been. Yeah. It's in its own realm yeah. of music. You can't even. Anyway. But so apparently he had been watching The Hives a lot at festivals and stuff and he wanted to make a, like a kind of a garage rock thing. Because you, you can almost yeah, you kind can of pick almost up on hear it, you know, it now that you say that, yeah. <laughs> but then it's so far, it's veered away from that. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really good argument to me for like sometimes, particularly in certain strains of dance music, club music, but also in other types of music, there's this real kind of purity or purism kind of streak that people are like, no, you cannot... Totally. It, you know, it has to be this thing and you cannot kind of bring in other disparate influences. And, and it's seen as a kind of watering down or, you know, mm. weakening of something to have a kind of mishmash of things, which, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I've just always been drawn to a mishmash of things. Those are the music that I like the most where they're kind yeah. of on the boundary between this. It's not quite this and it's not quite that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I just think that's how music, yeah, th like you say, there's so many examples of it in music history. That's kind of how music works, you know, like people trying yeah. to do one thing, not having the same skills or context or whatever. Totally. Um, yeah. 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 It took me a long time to get over this idea of types of music sounding authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've always loved dance music and electronic music, but, I, but because I kind of grew up in the kind of like quote unquote rock mm -hmm. world, I always felt like if I made dance music, it would sound inauthentic. Mm -hmm. And like with other things too, R and B and hip hop, but even like psych rock. You know, when I started making psych rock, I thought I wasn't being authentic. You know, so it took me a long time to to sort of get over that kind of like paranoia, mm -hmm. or like that kind of concept, because obviously it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, but I've definitely had it myself. Yeah, that same feeling. Do you know this album by this guy Charanjeet Singh called uh, no. Ten Ragas to a Disco Beat? What's it called? I, mean, I forget how many ragas. It sounds great. It, was made, it sounds like it's a sick album. It's unbelievable. It's this guy in, he was just like a soundtrack composer in India, and he made an album with like all the Roland stuff, like a 303 and a drum machine and, yeah. and I don't know, maybe a Juno or something. And uh, he was just playing ragas, you know? He was like, but with an acid yeah. bass line and a drum machine. Yeah. And he just totally accidentally invented house music and techno completely okay. independently. You know, I, I don't know, as a kind of record, record collector kind of person, when I heard that, I was like, oh, and, and obviously it sounds very different because the scales are different, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, I love those anomalies. Uh, that's kind of also goes to what we were talking about before. When I'm making music, I'm always thinking that if people listen to it all or if it's sti like mm. still around in a few years at all, it'll be viewed as a kind of, well, there was this weirdo doing this kind of like half this, half that kind of thing. Um, yeah. That's very much in my mindset because all a lot of the music that I love are those kind of weird anomaly, mm -hmm. outsider-ish kind of things. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever think about your music being appreciated retrospectively? Like I only, I only say that because a friend of mine makes music and he likes to think of it as being listened to in 30 years. He likes right. to think of it wow. as an album someone finds in some dusty old record store in 30 right. years. More so than, than people listening to it right now. You know, there's something about that discovering it after a long time that does it for him, you know? That's a cool way of thinking about it, actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a funny thing and it plays into another thought that I have the world is full of music, obviously, ever mm -hmm. more so. Mm -hmm. The thought of making music, adding something to that, is this crazy, like, act of ego. I mean, I don't think <laughs> either you or I are kind of egomaniacs, yeah. but you have to kind of mm -hmm. trick yourself into this 
mindset that like what we're going to yeah. do, we're going to sit down and do something worthwhile, even though there have already been like a yeah. hundred million songs written in the world or, you know, yeah. it's funny. I think about that and I think it's some kind of a trick, like a self-deception, you know, that allows me to sit down and think, I'm going to write the best song in the world today. It's obviously not going to happen. But if you don't think that, you never do it. You know, you never try. Absolutely. I'm beginning to think that a certain amount of ego is vital in the creative process. There's something about it, and it sounds really bad, but, you know, there's something about the feeling of, of like kind of like a, an inherent self-importance, mm. you know? I don't know, I don't know. I'm, yeah. Well, I wonder if you have the same kind of feeling, because it sounds to me like you grew up in a scene in Perth yep. that reminds me of the town that I grew up in. Do you have any friends who you're like, oh, that friend makes such amazing music, is so creative and interesting, if only like they'd finished that song that they played me that was half finished, yeah. it would be so great and everybody would love it and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, and I know so many people like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were doing more interesting things than I was, but I was so desperate to be doing exactly what we're doing right now, like playing gigs around the world and having people listen to my music. That just was this crazy drive just to kind of have this imagined thing of quote unquote being a musician yeah. was one of the things driving me to to keep doing stuff. And th I guess that's some kind of, you know, ambition or e ego or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, I mean, yeah. That too. Isn't it funny? Like how important ambition is, is in that sense. But neither of us probably would think of ourselves as ambitious people like like somebody who's you know get, goes into business or what you know what i mean it's, it's a weird yeah. in music it's a very weird thing so yeah it's a funny thing to, to i mean about. i definitely have that distorted fantasy that that i'm gonna write like the greatest pop song of all time mm -hmm. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it sounds it sounds stupid saying it out loud and it's obviously not completely true but it's like yeah i don't know it's weird well, you've written some pretty damn good pop songs, so... Oh, yeah. thanks, man. Well, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you are operating on, under that assumption because it's, <laughs> it's working out pretty well. <laughs> anyway, I, yeah, I'm really glad. I, I don't know about you. I've, I've kind of stopped doing all press and stuff. And we, we the times that we've met in the past, it's been like, you know, a sh pretty short thing at a festival or whatever. And I've always thought oh, it'd yeah. be great to get to like, not that this is exactly hanging out, but that we'd get to... Yeah, hang out and talk more. So I was yeah. immediately it's as I was close like, as we'll get for a lot for a while. It's as close as we'll get for a while, and I hope <laughs> we do get to cross paths uh, in person before too long. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's been really nice to talk. Yeah, dude. I've uh, since this thing got teed up, I've been thinking about it a lot. You know, I've been uh, yeah. Me too. It's it's allowed me to. I mean, obviously, I've listened to your music loads and love it, but it also I was like, I'm gonna go back and like listen to it all in a really intensive way too which was yeah. i've enjoyed loads as per <laughs> always when i listen to your music so thanks yeah. man it's been you great. too I, I did the same thing i've on the two times i've been dry, i've driven down south i've had caribou on the whole time nice cool well thanks wicked cool nice to talk to you kevin yeah man you too Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Melissa Kaplan. The TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. If you want to follow more album reviews, essays, and podcasts, you can follow TalkHouse on your favorite social media. And that'll do it for this week. Josh is back in next. Thanks for listening. <laughs>